Hi everybody, this is Alchemist 2, and I'm back again with another series review, actually an anime series review. Um, I did a review on Queen's Blade, The Evil Eye, which was season 2. Uh, I actually should have watched season 1 first, <laughs> honestly. Um, season 1 is really spectacular. You get introduced to all the characters and their motivations and where they come from and uh, particularly the most interesting aspect of this is um, the relationship that Lena and Claudette have because Claudette seems to be the more mature of the two women and she's always pointing out how naive Lena is and how much of a child she is and all that. Um, the truth of the matter is Lena is actually the one who grows and transitions over the series and she she transforms into a very <laughs> powerful character um, and she immediately just like in the second series she became my my favorite character although I have to say I, I really enjoy each character equally on their own terms just because they're all very unique and you just can't have one favorite with Queen's Blade. It's just um, the way it's done. And uh, um, I know I said I really liked Malona in the second series. I, I do like her. I don't know why. Maybe it's because she's a shapeshifter and shapeshifters have always um, fascinated me. She comes across as um, more of a psychopath in this particular series and for good reason but she's just so intriguing and um, different from all the other characters um, her abilities are very interesting um, <clears throat> but I, I still like her as a character I, I would have to say out of the the three Menace and um, what was her name? Eerie? the little maid girl with the sigh. Um, they're all very intriguing on their own account. She's my absolute favorite of the three that uh, serve the Swamp Witch and whatnot. Um, <laughs> maybe it's just because of her uh, talents and uh, her fighting ability and, and how she turns people's uh, <coughs> strengths against themselves, but in the case of um, Lena, yeah, it, it comes back to haunt her. <laughs> She's, uh, she finds herself backed against a corner, well, figurative corner, but anyway, I won't really say what happens because it's really quite the turnabout and it's one that you don't expect, but in a way you kind of do because from the beginning you were rooting for her the entire way you want to see her succeed. Um, it doesn't disappoint, needless to say. Um, hi, I'm doing a review. Okay, I see you're up. I'll be with you in a minute, okay? All right. <laughs> My dad's a sleepy little bear. <laughs> um, anyway, as I was saying, uh, first season I really enjoyed and uh, of course there's plenty of fan service for the guys out there uh, I really wasn't bothered by the fan service per se um, it's very sensual <laughs> I wasn't uh, I wasn't perturbed by it I thought yeah this is gonna turn me off it's this is all itchy um, no it really didn't I, I just thought it added more to the story and it was uh, Different from anything else I had ever watched. It, it kind of reminded me of Mouse, if you've ever seen um, the series. It's very, very short, but Mouse is um, <laughs> it's more of a sexy comedy than anything. This is more of like a fantasy adventure quest type and explains uh, how the Queen's Blade actually begins with Aldra. And Aldra is extremely powerful. She is a, a witch with all these different uh, abilities. She can uh, turn people to stone. Um, 
That's really frightening. This little girl, this little girl, with, uh, she seems rather bland and unimportant, but when, <laughs> when you realize she has that kind of power, you think, holy crud. <laughs> I wonder if these women know what they're up against. Yeah, well, second season. We see more of that, and you learn both to love and hate Queen Aldra, and then Queen Aldra actually has more of a, a tragic background in the second season, and you uh, start to feel more for her, which is really interesting. I never really thought that would occur. Uh, I learned <coughs> there's a third season, and um, according to the synopsis, my favorite character, Elena, is not really that much involved with it. She becomes a narcoleptic, which is kind of unusual. I wonder how she develops narcolepsy, but um, it doesn't really explain that. But they said that there's a possibility of even a, a another season afterward that would explain why, because in the this third season it doesn't really go into it. But this uh, the third season has more characters involved in it, so I'm probably going to have to watch that as well once it comes out onto DVD. And I've really enjoyed the series, and it's been um, sensational. I, I didn't think that I would at first. I thought, oh, this is going to be like Icky Tosin, which is nothing but fan service, which I absolutely hated. I mean, it was no, no substance, no plot, just a lot of TNA, and... Um, Nothing but that. This was this was better. Um, yes, it yes it is sensual, but you know I did I wasn't really bothered by that because I I viewed it as art, so um, it didn't really. I'm a woman, so <laughs> but I, even as even as a woman, and I'm not gay, okay, but I you know pretty forms. <laughs> what else can I say? Pretty forms in motion. It's like uh, Greek wrestling, way back when. <laughs> Nothing is new under the sun, period. But um, it just reminded me of that and the accounts that I had recalled on on that. And I, I think that's probably where the inspiration comes from. And then this day and age, everybody thinks it's a new thing. It really isn't. <laughs> but um, it's a really good series. And if you like that kind of thing, I mean, fan service, it's a good plot, I mean, the the plot is really quite intriguing, and it's very engaging, and from the, from the second that you start watching it, you think, oh, this is different than anything else I've ever seen, and it kind of has that uh, Mortal Kombat kind of atmosphere, which, coming from my childhood background, uh, playing Mortal Kombat was my ultimate uh, pleasure, and it just gave me such a thrill. It, it was an adrenaline rush, and it was just incredible and just uh, spectacular, and it's just excellent. It, it really is. I have to say that I really love this series, and I, I um, recommend it for anybody. Um, it's not for kids, granted. <laughs> Uh, if you're an older uh, person, uh, I would definitely recommend it and, you know, censor it. But there, there really isn't anything, well, too objectionable. I, I'm not really sure how to say this, but um, if you're a young child and you're looking into that, I would suggest you have parental guidance looking into it. I know I sound kind of like a prude, but if you're enjoying it for the artistic merit of it, then... I applaud you. Um, not really sure what else to say about the series other than I give it two thumbs up, five stars, hands down. Cannot wait for third season. Possibility of a fourth season. I don't know because, well, those lucky Japanese, they get everything before we do. <laughs> so they probably have a fourth series. Um, I wanted to update you on projects I'm working on. I'm currently writing a Robin Hood script. Well, it's a modern day version of Robin Hood. Um, I've currently finished a fantasy romance that is going to be on um, fictionpress.com. It's called Lady Night in Waiting, or Alessandra's Quest is the other name of it. 
um, has two titles. Imagine that. Uh, <laughs> I'm working on a story right now called Twelve Lights. It's um, inspired by Homestuck, but it's completely different from Homestuck. There, there are no trolls or anything. It has nothing to do with that. It's more along the line of um, kind of uh, shoho, you know, magical girl thing. Um, they're not all girls, though. Uh, my characters are uh, both male and female, and they all have different zodi uh, zodiological signs, so it's, it's very similar to Sailor Moon. But it's different, and I took a lot of different elements, like uh, from Time Bokan, my trio. Yeah, you can see where I probably derived that, and it's not a coincidence. I thought, yeah, I'm going to do that because I haven't really seen that done too terribly often, and I just want to pay that homage, and uh, <laughs> it's something that I really enjoy. And um, she's kind of a an arrogant character, my my main villainess. Um, She's really not that evil, <laughs> to be quite honest with you. <sighs> she just has to have energy from other planetary systems in order to maintain her youth and beauty. But but she um, goes through a transformation, and you know I wanted to do that because I had never done it before. So I've got that little bit of My Little Pony friendship is magic thing going too. Um. Let's see, what else am I writing? I'm going to be writing, and this was inspired by Wizards vs. Aliens, if you've ever watched that program, which I really like. Um, it's by Russell T. Davies, who's a Doctor Who uh, writer. Just absolutely adore him. If, if you are a fan of, of Doctor Who, then Wizards vs. Aliens is going to be your cup of tea. Trust me on this. It is really uh, superb. Uh, the, I, I've, it's actually a script. It's going to have two titles. So the main title is going to be Uncommon Magic, but the other one is My Next Door Neighbors or Wizards. And uh, I got a, I had a dream about it, and I thought, oh, this would make a great script. And you know, it's um, kind of got that whole Nanny McPhee uh, vibe with it, but it's going to be different from Manny McPhee. It's just uh, the whole thing of uh, my main character, uh, Thelonious or Theo, he has a suspicion that his next door neighbors aren't what they seem. Um, and he goes to check on Vivian, his uh, next door neighbor. Uh, the, she, he actually goes to school with, with Vivian. And um, he sees that she's got these they have ceramic pigs, and uh, you know the the ones that like garden gnomes. That they're just for decoration, but uh, she she's brought them to life and she's given them names. They don't need food or anything. At first, he thinks they're real pigs, and you know, those are nice little pet pigs you got. She, he thinks, and they're not really. They're ceramic, and he's, he's like, well, what's going on here? How did that happen? And she actually gave him a, a vivi vivifying. She actually uh, cast a vivify on them, and they became living creatures with th that don't need food. So <laughs> he's thinking, hmm, I don't think that she's actually a normal human being. She could be something other. So it, it has uh, that kind of Harry Potter, uh, Nanny McPhee kind of crossover vibe. For, uh, so I thought I would do something like that because I've never done it before in script form. Um, I talked about 12 lights. Um, if I look through my folder here, uh, there's another story I'm writing called Underground Justice. It's not yet completed, but basically it is about a group of people from different walks of life. They've all been injected, well, against their, against their wishes with a reptilian or amphibian DNA. And uh, they escape from their laboratories, from their oppressors, and uh, they go underground. And they become this uh, vigilante posse. I love the word posse. So they're um, bounty hunters underground, and they only come out at uh, the wee hours in the morning when all the crime's happening, when all the cool stuff happens, basically. Uh, and the police officers don't really care for this. Uh, unconventional group and the way they they get their information and they have to be careful just because normal people think well normal people really don't see this uh, posse 
So they don't know who's really in charge of really cleaning up the streets at nights, and it's those guys, or them, or is it they? It is, it is they. Okay, it is they <laughs> that um, that do the necessary uh, justice in the city <laughs> at night. Um, other than that, uh, I was working on. There was a story about it was kind of like Xavier's school for the gifted thing, um, in the in the wilderness. Where was it? Um, hmm. If I can find it. Well, I can't really think of what it was called. Oh, yeah, it was called Outdoor Learning Academy, but I was trying to find it. And if I can locate it. Is it even here? <laughs> there it is. But I'm actually going to read the synopsis of it. Uh, synopsis, a <laughs> synop. <laughs> but basically, it, I'll dictate this. Uh, the outdoor learning acti uh, the, bleh, the outdoor <laughs> learning academy, or OLA, is a place where students can learn the basics as well as survival skills. Students are also given outlets to find their true talents, and those with special needs are welcome, as well as the handicap or handicapable, as I like to say. Religion is not preached here, only science and spirit. So, yeah, they're given, and it's sort of like Percy Jackson in a way, because um, they are assigned to cabins like uh, with names like Zeus or Hermes and Ares and things like that. So, it's really not. <laughs> It's really not gotten too much in depth yet, but I'm working on it. And I've got some characters already involved. My, my main uh, camp staff, uh, my counselors, basically. I've got Ranger. Ranger George is a counselor, and he's, an, he's a resident expert on all plants, animals. He's a geologist and anthropologist and ichthyologist. Uh, he's an adventurer. Um, and Alice is the, another <laughs> counselor. She's got a huge heart. She's just a, a really uh, gregarious woman. Uh, <laughs> I, I do my uh, <laughs> my narrative comes from this uh, character named Zane. And this is going to be good, though. I'm very, very happy with it so far. And it's called the Camp of Miracles for a reason. But that's basically all I have to report, and I will keep you up to date as soon as I get to more stuff done. I've got a a parody I've written. Um, I'm going to do a recording of it fairly soon, so you can. Uh, have your ears feast on its musical genius. <laughs> that sounded very arrogant and conceited coming from me. Yeesh, but um, I shall see you next time. Catch you on the flip side, Clyde.